Our first witness is witness number 600. There's a new witness, and we, have, we do not have a written statement. The witness is a high ranking, or former high ranking member of IRGC, has approached the council only yesterday evening. He has been interviewed, checked, and now will appear as our first witness today. Can we have the next witness online, please? Mr. Witness, can you hear me? Yes. I'm going to ask the chair to swear you in. Mr. Witness, thank you very much for agreeing to testify. Uh, would you repeat after me, please? I solemnly declare that I will speak the truth. I solemnly declare to speak the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Questions now from the prosecuting counsel, followed by questions from the panel. Mr. Witness, before I begin with our questions, you understand that there is no immunity given to you for appearing today before the tribunal, correct? Yes, I understand. And it is uh, my understanding that you are a a senior officer of the IRGC in Tehran, and you were in charge of collecting reports for your department during the Aban protests. That is correct. You share with us your what you would like regarding the Aban. Well, this is uh, while we're waiting for counsel. Just that you might uh, need to lean forward a little. Yes. Um, Can you please uh, tell us what you would like to share regarding the Aban 2019 protests? Okay, is that better? That's better, much better. I would like to express my greetings to the members of the tribunal and all the viewers. I would like to say a few things about the clashes, uh, the weapons used, and the authority, the unlimited authority given to the officers, and also what I saw in the field. The ones who were killed, arrested, detained, and the rest. And I would like to present all that to the tribunal. I am a senior officer of, of Tehran IRGC. Voluntarily, I asked and tried to contact the tribunal and to inform the tribunal of what went on during Aban 98 and 88. I've been a witness to, a, to an extensive arrest and interrogation. And unfortunately, I have been one of the members who have arrested, who had arrested uh, 
certain individuals. I had also been witness to some interrogations. I hadn't been involved much in, the, in, in the interrogations. I have also been a witness to the conversation among my friends and colleagues. I have been a privy to the reports on the killings and clashes, and each of these reports need hours of explanation if the tribunal would be interested in. If there are any particular questions I can explain, I can also give you names and also play, mention the places where incidents have happened. Start with <clears throat> the preparation. What kind of preparation or when did you all start um, getting ready for the protests from the side of the RAGC? Generally speaking, the IRGC has a huge budget. A section of this IRGC is to be pre is to uh, uh, is to act against the riots, and they get specific training in connection to Aba ninety eight. The IRGC got ready in a, a week before. A, an order was issued from the top that all the forces should be ready. The forces were objecting that one week would not be enough for readiness, for preparedness. And nothing was mentioned about the uh, fuel issue, and they were just told that you should be ready for a riot. That was all. So this was. So you were asked to prepare one week before without knowledge. They had not announced the fuel prices yet. Is that correct? Yes. We knew that something was going to happen, but probably the heads of the three branches of uh, government were also um, somehow surprised. They didn't know that this would happen. This is b based on what I have heard from the discussions among the IRGC uh, colleagues. Uh, the Council knows my job, so I don't want to exactly mention uh, what I have heard. But my colleagues knew that uh, uh, there was uh, going to be such problems due to the uh, increase in the fuel prices. The Mr. Rouhani, if he has said just one thing right in his life, is that he wasn't aware when the prices would go up, and he was only informed on Friday. And this might be the only. Uh, truth that he had ever mentioned in his life. Okay, let's go. Let's talk about the preparation a little bit more. What exactly did that entail? Did you have to give training? Were you told to have specific weapons? Tell us a little bit more about the preparation part. In Amadeshada. The preparation was not just related to Arba 98. This readiness uh, and uh, this unit uh, uh, was uh, already prepared for many years. There were some independent units formed in the IRGC, but the other units also received uh, regular trainings. Uh, but for Arban 98, I should say that we did not have any particular training. Decision was made so quickly that um, from the top that even the units were surprised. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, it was not uh, um, supposed to have the uh, announcement on the price hike of the fuel price hike. And they knew that if they would announce uh, that uh, news, maybe they could not be, if they would uh, announce that the fuel prices would go up gradually and if the people would be informed, maybe they would get ready to come out. 
so they announced it immediately at one time, and that led to a huge uh, um, protest, and that's why uh, we see that the IRGC had to come out with their normal uh, readiness. I may also explain further that if there was readiness for uh, the time, and if there had been planning and programming, certainly there wouldn't have been so many um, uh, arrests and killings and such uh, uh, violence. One of the reasons that we had such brutal violence and the forces were not able to control the situation was that there wasn't appropriate planning for the uh, situation. Uh, they hadn't planned properly that we would have uh, such uh, risky locations uh, when the prices go up and we would ask for help for the local authorities and like that. So such plannings had not been made and suddenly everything happened and went out of hand. And when you don't plan in advance, this will be the result. And as a result, when the units went in, the forces went in, on the second and on the third day, the situation became critical, went out of hand. and. Uh, uh, fire at will order was issued as a result. And the forces were told that wherever you felt necessary, you can just choose to fire. Arban 98. Even more than 19, uh, even more than uh, 1388 and 86 was a time that the um, military personnel did not report on the firing at people or the number of ammunition they used, and they did not report where they used their ammunition and who they shot at. So the issue was easily neglected. Uh, but while the military personnel can, uh, can endorse and confirm this issue, that uh, the armed forces should always um, declare who they had shot at, where they were sh shooting, and how, many, how much ammunition they had used, and what uh, ammunition was left and they should hand over the weapons and the ammunition uh, back uh, and if there was any shortcoming uh, they should report it. Well, in Arbonne 98 this did not happen. The number of the ammunition were never counted and nobody was asked how much they had used, how much ammunition they had used. Okay, just, just to clarify, what, when, did you, when did you notice that there was violence coming from the other side. I mean, because the forces would only shoot if they were threatened, correct? Baby, Well, in front of us, there were a number of people who had no weapons. They didn't even have um, knives. They were just chanting slogans. They were upset. They knew that the prices would increase uh, since the oil prices, petrol prices had tripled. The other prices would also increase. There were a number of hungry people who were shouting and they were asking for bread, as we call it, if you will. And there were no violence from them. They had uh, blocked the roads. They were turning off the cars on the roads. They were burning down, burning the uh, rubbish bins. And wherever there was a protest that you could not control or you could not anticipate, there was no option but to confront it. And it was on the second or the third day of the protests that the reports indicated that the protests had become red. They even said that maybe the radio and television could uh, uh, be lost to the people. Um, so the forces were notified and asked that they were, um, they had a free hand to shoot at people, arrest people, and even enter the houses of those uh, who um, the protesters might resort to. So there was no need for any warrant uh, from the judiciary. You could detain the cars, you should uh, detain people, you could do anything so that you could overcome uh, this up unrest because the country was at risk. Okay, can you talk about the kind of 
training you receive uh, or training that the IRGC receives for crowd control? The, the, you've been a, since you're a senior official in the IRGC, it is presumed that you've had to deal with other protests. Is there specific training that you receive for crowd control or protest? I already mentioned that the trainings were provided in advance to forces. The forces received training regularly, especially the uh, logistic uh, units, uh, the Sabri unit, Imam Ali unit, and there are other units which I will not name. There are some that I cannot name at all because of my position. Uh, there are some units that are responsible for suppressing and uh, the uh, riots and crackdown. But at the time of Aban 98, it was not an issue of training. It was the authority that was given. The Basij was given the authority to use military weapons. That is to say, they could take military weapons into the square, the Basij, which is on the four, at the fourth grade of the armed forces, the lowest uh, grade of the armed forces. So the military experts uh, who were among them were providing the lowest uh, grade, uh, military grade of the country, to take military weapons to the square, to the field, then that would mean that the uh, ones above them would have much greater authority and they could do whatever they like then. Give the authority to do this. Who gave the order? Baby, uh, man, uh, uh. As I mentioned, the order I'll try to be accurate. Uh, I can say that this came from the commander in chief. Is there did did the IRGC at any point in time ask foreign troops or elements from foreign countries to participate in helping to stop the protests? Uh, we in Iran always have different forces from Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. They are in various uh, barracks of uh, the IRGC, Anari, Semnan, Desert, Baramin, Desert. They are constantly receiving training. So it is quite logical to use those forces when you are short of forces. In 98, everyone or every unit faced shortage of forces. That's why permission to shoot was issued so that the crisis would be controlled and contained. When you're authorized to contain a crisis at whatever price, it is quite natural that you would use the forces that were being trained at the time, even if they were foreign forces. When I said that the commander-in-chief issued the order, I meant the supreme leader. Did you use children? meaning under the age of 18. Personally, I did encounter some Basij militia, and I couldn't naturally ask them their age, but they looked very young, and uh, they had uh, batons, they had electronic batons, they had Kalashnikovs, and uh, unfortunately, as you know, um, the youth are um, 
and be, are very impressionable and they become very excited in these situations. And on many occasions, I actually witnessed how these um, children under the age of 18 who were armed around Engalab Square in Karaj Behbudi uh, Street. And I actually saw Basijis who were armed and who had ammunition and uh, they uh, they didn't even uh, even use uh, um, any uh, they they would just shoot in the air um, to um, because they were excited and they wanted to intimidate the people and they were just uh, um, trigger happy uh, in a way and I saw some of them were and I warned um, actually one of these Basijis and I said stop because uh, we're not under threat. These people are a distance away from us at the moment. But sadly they have been trained the way I was trained and I know and uh, that they are ready to die because they believe there is a, um, for a sacred goal which doesn't in reality exist. There is nothing sacred about this. Questions deals with the reporting that you did, and what I'm interested in finding out is exactly what were you reporting about during the protests? What were you responsible for sharing, and who were you responsible for sharing the information to? My responsibility in view of the fact that the telephone lines were not secure and uh, and I can elaborate on all that uh, later. The responsibility of myself and many others was to with use our presence um, to because we and witness detention centers, the protests, and give an official report to our superiors. And, uh, um, and I can tell you later what my, um, when, when you have a closed session, what my responsibility was in detail, in greater detail. But uh, I had to assess the situation and tell them how dangerous it was or it was becoming and report to my seniors. Was this information shared among all the forces, including the local police? No, not at all, no. This. Uh, information was very secret, highly secret and cl classified uh, and, uh, and and it it is only to be reported to very, very specific people who make major decisions, nobody else. And uh, of course, we're, because of my position, because I was in a senior position, all doors were open to me, all detention centers, all uh, uh, morgues, coroner, uh, coroner's um, offices, any um, bases. Because of my position, they, um, they had to be uh, to respond to my requests. At this time, uh, Mr. Witness, we're going to stop. I'm going to ask the journalist to leave the room for a closed session. So if you could please wait one minute. No. No. I can, I still have a few things that I don't mind reporters hearing about, if you're okay with that. Okay. You can stay for a little while. Okay, why don't you go ahead and share what it is you want to share? Uh, 
Um, let me, can I, can I continue? Yes, please, continue. Do you want to, it might be easier if you ask me questions because there is so much and I don't exactly know where to, uh, how to start. So why don't you just ask me questions? Continue with the questions, Mr. Witness. Have we lost him? We have. We seem to have uh, lost contact. We'll have the witness back in two minutes. Oh, he's back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Witness. Shall we start with the first day of demonstrations on 25th of Aban? Where were you and what, is, what was your position? And if you can explain the geographic area where you were in. Mr. Witness? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. Yes, please give me a minute. Yes. Mm, again, my greetings. And uh, so, can you please explain where you were on 25th of Aban? That's the first day of demonstrations. And what was your area of activity and what did you see during the first day? From two two in the morning on Thursday I was in various parts of Tehran and also in, uh, I was, went to Karaj, Valley Astra Square. These are areas I covered and where I witnessed. And on the second and the third day, they said the city is, we are losing the city and even the state radio and TV and they ordered the Basij units, Imam Ali units, Sabirin units to use the uh, utmost force against the protesters. And I witnessed how people were arrested, taken by b uh, on the bus, uh, and many, whether they were injured, uh, young boys, girls, they, and I witnessed how they were taken to IRGC detention center, especially in Tahti uh, Street, where there is a sports stadium. And uh, I witnessed the interrogations, the beatings, and uh, uh, the, how they would undress them in the cold weather and in en masse. And hundreds of them, 150 of them, or they would, one doesn't even t treat animals like that. And I witnessed how they were being beaten up. I saw many bodies. And before I forget, I would like to mention, it, it's very important to say how the bodies, the dead bodies, and um, the way the intelligence service of the IRGC was uh, treating these people. And uh, I, 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 I saw the Kurdish people who were, some of them, their sons had come to take their fathers uh, to 
to take the bodies of their fathers and they would pledge and say, please just give us the bodies of our father and we will not tell anyone about it and we will bury our father without telling anyone that he was protesting or he was, he was shot and we'll keep silent. Um, but uh, we said, don't, don't you, uh, but, uh, and, and I remember three sons were begging, and they were three butch sons were begging to collect their uh, father's body. And then there was somebody else, a father, whose son was also uh, shot. And he was also promising not to tell anyone, just to give them the body of uh, 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 love, his loved one. And I remember for a month, he kept his, the, um, his son's body on ice before burying it. But the intelligence found out about it, that he was hiding his son's body on ice. And, they, and uh, some were uh, promising to, uh, say that, uh, um, to say that your son will say your son was a martyr um, if you keep quiet. I never saw any of the protesters bearing arms. I never heard of anyone who had arms and weapons and was arrested. And I know in Luristan they were saying, oh, in Luristan and Khuzestan, and uh, there are tribes that uh, are armed. But uh, yes, and they had raided their houses because traditionally some of these tribes have some weapons and their houses were uh, uh, Rated, but I heard from reliable sources that in Khuzestan the number of victims was actually frightening. In in three uh, provinces, Luristan and Khuzestan and Alborz provinces, the violence was at its worst, and Alborz was uh, it's, uh, said that Alborz is a weak point of the Nizam, is the Achilles heels of the Nizam, uh, of the system, and uh, that in Alborz, the many, many were killed. And I saw blankets covered, uh, dead bodies covered with blankets, and, and I saw some of them naked uh, and in cells, and I could see their feet uh, from under the blankets. Some had one shoe on, some had no shoes on, but they were all killed, and they'd covered them with blankets. I saw some with bloody clothes, and, and I, this scene brought back memories of the war era for me. And I tell you, I'm hearing from, I've heard from reliable sources. And due to my position, I know they were reliable. And uh, they, were, they were saying Tehran is, uh, we are losing Tehran. And uh, we've, we've heard also from provinces that uh, some of the forces, even police forces who are showing weakness in um, encountering the protesters. Mr. Khalafi, Mr. Wali Haqqanian, these are my sources. And the sources I'm talking about, they had, oh no, sorry, the sources told me that these two had ordered uh, to, um, that you should shoot anyone you see on the street in order to quell this uh, unrest, do shoot anyone at will. Can you please explain the position of Mr. Khalafi and Rahid Haqqanian? Mr. Khalafi was uh, was in charge of the supreme leaders uh, uh, the administration of the supreme leader and also the uh, protocol. And in the crisis uh, situation, and they are that although he was in charge of the supreme leader protocol, for instance, when uh, Mr. Khamenei has a meeting, 
he is the one who decides who should sit where, who should sit next to the Supreme Leader, who should sit away from the, and he's the Supreme Leader. He's also in very close touch with the Friday Imams um, nationwide, uh, such as Mr. Hijazi. He is actually number one after Mr. Khamenei, who uh, orders, uh, gives orders, uh, communicates the orders to IRGC commanders, and then IRGC commanders uh, and by turn pass it on to others uh, below them. So he is the one who actually uh, pass, gives the orders to IRGC commanders. He is the highest uh, order. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Haqqanian and Mr. Khalafi had said uh, they were the ones who had ordered that we should do whatever uh, possible to end this uh, unrest, and they had brought semi-heavy weapons, and they had brought uh, Dushka. Um, uh, Dushka is a semi-heavy weapon, and it's not, it shouldn't be used in uh, um, uh, wars, in, 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 in fighting in the cities. They're war weapons, but they were used in these uh, protests. Sorry, I didn't hear that, Mr. Sabi. What you just said. <laughs> Mr. Hakonian is, in fact, we can hear you. Mr. Hakonian is, in fact, the voice of Mr. Khamenei. Mr. Hakonian is the one, not now, of course, up to last year, all the issues related to the supreme leaders. Residence was managed by him. Even the text of the speech of Mr. Khamenei was checked by him. Mr. Hakonian has been working along with Khamenei for 30 years. His, Mr. Khamenei's children have grown up under his um, uh, control and uh, he is aware of all the details of the life of Khamenei and he checks everything uh, related to him. And if you take a look at the films, he's always behind uh, Mr. Khamenei. He doesn't wear a military uniform and he is a an advisor to Khamenei. He dictates, in fact, somehow to Khamenei what he should do, where to go, what to do. And all Mr. Khamenei's children respect him. All the commanders of the IRGC respect him. I would like to say here by certainty that all the commanders of the army, IRGC, Friday play, the, the ministers, they are all afraid of Mr. Haqqanian because they know that Mr. Haqqanian has great power. And if we just tell the, uh, if, and if you will just uh, advise uh, Khamenei, then the commanders of the RGC could be removed. For example, some of them have been removed uh, that I don't want to mention here. Maybe in the private sessions I will mention them. Um, there was an individual, one of the commanders, <coughs> who wanted to be a bit more moderate, but Mr. Haqqanian uh, wouldn't say that he is this in the second rank in terms of uh, authority and protocol uh, ranking, but I say that he is the first individual after Khamenei. Uh, that is to say, he even dictates to Mr. Khamenei sometimes what he should do and what he should say. I've been witness to that. Um, not me, of course. I haven't been witness, but my friends and colleagues have told me that Mr. Haqqanian tells Khamenei what should happen and who should be allowed to go and see him and who would, should not be allowed to see him and visit him. Thank you, Mr. Witness. Is this your evidence that the order of shoot to kill came directly from the leader's office and on his orders? A reliable source told me on the third day, that is, 
at the night of the third day, I have accurate information that a reliable source who had been working along with me, that Mr. Haqqanian and Khalafi, at the uh, Supreme Leader's office had said that you should go and wrap it up. Wrap it up at whatever price, at any price. So that was an order to the military, and the military knew what it meant. When they say wrap it up, they know exactly what it meant. It means that if you need to kill everyone, it wouldn't matter. There would be no questioning if you even kill all the people. We knew the meaning as military personnel, what he meant. And exactly that was what was meant. The, the beginning. When you put together the testimonies of other witnesses, you will see that the, from the same night, the harsh uh, uh, um, encounter started and the violent uh, and brutal encounter against the protesters started from the same night when that order was issued. <clears throat> Mr. Witness, can you confirm that, at least in your area, how many of the protesters were shot and killed, and how many were injured, and do you have figures that how many were arrested and tortured? The number of those detained after I had a discussion with my colleagues and friends in line with our duty and business, exchanging information, the number of the detainees was much higher than what the people thought. It was about and around the ones who went to the public uh, prisons. I'm not talking about a 5,000 prison, which is a very uh, uh, frightening prison. I talking about the ordinary prisons. There were about seven to eight thousand people arrested only in Tehran, and some of them were only being hit by cables or with hoses, and they were being beaten by legs and kicked. Some of them uh, left some deeds, and they were released. Some of them uh, had their families coming back, and they get involved. And uh, the number of the those who were killed, based on the reliable sources. And when I say my friends, I mean those who were working in that field, who were in charge of gathering information. And when they provided and uh, showed me the reports on the seventh or the eighth day, there were 427 people who were killed in Khuzestan only. Um, well, I had seen a large number of people, about 417 or 420 people were killed in Tehran. And there were a large number of people who were killed in Karaj. There were about 17 people in Bumehen who were killed up to that date. Uh, and there were reports that there were some bodies that they had taken control of. But there were some uh, bodies whose families had taken away uh, and had buried without making any noise and hop and uh, hue and cry. So these were the uh, number of those who were uh, killed and the bodies were in the hands of the forces. You refer to the detention centers, and I guess you mentioned a detention center that was not a public detention center. Can you explain what you mean by that? Ben. Yes, the IRGC has got its own detention centers. Number 66, they belong to those who have uh, uh, violated uh, 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 from the IRGC employees. And there are some uh, places where the dual nationalities uh, like Ms. Zaghari are being kept at, and I follow her news. And there are some other individuals who I don't want to mention their names because then it would become clear who I am and what position I hold. Many were, have been taken to those detention centers. They didn't know where exactly they were taken to, but these were the detention centers that they were taken to. Uh, the detention center 5000, it's a specific unit of the intelligence department of the IRGC. It's for the dual nationalities, those spies 
um, um, who work for the foreign forces, the, the ones who are accused of uh, espionage or are suspicious of espionage, they are being kept in those detention centers. If they go into those, uh, those detention centers, they should be very lucky to get out of it. It's in the end of the world. They will be under psychological pressure and physical pressure. They have an open hand in those detention centers. They don't need any, um, any um, um, war warrant or anything. They can do anything in, that, in those detention centers. They can take all what you, belongs to you overnight. They can confiscate whatever they want. Uh, uh, they can create any type, type of case against you, homosexuality, uh, trade, uh, um, uh, betrayal, anything, uh, treason and everything. And all uh, the uh, judiciary officials are also afraid of those in charge in these uh, detention centers. Uh, and they will uh, also sign any paper that they want for those in charge of those detention centers. This is uh, detention center number 5,000. <coughs> detention center number <coughs> 5,000. First of all, may I ask the witness to slow down because the interpreters have difficulty in catching up. Detention center number 5,000, I understand it's not organization and it's controlled by IRGC without any interference or oversight by the judiciary. Is that correct? Um. Detention center 5,000 is a detention center for the arrest and interrogation belonging to the intelligence department of the IRGC. It is a nightmare even for those who work for in the IRGC. They say whoever would go there, they will not come back alive. The detention center 5000 is the center of power. Ta'eb may do whatever he likes over there with whoever he likes. Even the MPs, the members of the parliament who talked a lot at the in the parliament, who uh, try to act as a reformist or who, who say anything against the Supreme Leader after a few hours of being interrogation in that area, they would know that they should go back and they should not repeat what they were saying. The, det the detention center 5000 is where you have the information of all the families. You can have all your private information and they can make any changes in those information. They can accuse you of anything over there. They can accuse your children of anything in that detention center. They can accuse your family of anything. So they can um, create anything and uh, whatever is important for a family can be used as a means against the individual without any uh, legal uh, uh, um, procedure. And so you see that how cases are being built for dual nationalities individuals and even those who are within the system are being treated uh, much worse. Uh, the 5000 detention center it doesn't follow the orders of any place apart from the intelligence department of the IRGC. The intelligence department of the IRGC only responds to Khamenei uh, in person and doesn't even respond uh, to Mr. Taeb. He um, Mr. Taib only responds directly to Mr. Khamenei. He says, I've done this and that, and this is what I want to do, and that is it. This is a very frightening organization. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Taib is number nine on the list of the accused as the head of the intelligence department of the IRGC. Thank you, Mr. Witness. The panel will have questions from you, and then we will make a private session after that. Ms. Rohan. Um, good morning, Mr. Witness, and um, thank you very much for being here and providing the testimony that you're providing, which is extremely important. I have only a few questions because I'm sure there'll be many questions from the panel, and we're only partway through this. Um, if I jump around a little bit, please excuse me. 
I'm trying to focus just on a couple of areas. Um, you mentioned that an order came out from the Supreme Leader, which essentially said, do whatever you need to do to put down these protests. And I'm wondering the practicalities, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the practicalities of how that order uh, was actually implemented. In other words, did it go down through an existing structure within the IRGC, for example, or another security force? Or was it an order that was simply made known generally um, such that local forces, for example, local police, the uh, Basiji, whatever, felt given the existence of that order that they could simply do what they wanted to do in their local area. Do you understand what I'm driving? Look, um, there is a hierarchy in the Islamic Republic as there is any, in any other country. That um, when they want to communicate an order, it has to come from the commander in chief. As such, an order which is a uh, um, very, very serious one has to come from the highest order. And once it's communicated, all forces who are involved uh, have been given this. Look, the army uh, 10 years ago, did uh, the army didn't do much. And as you remember, 10 years ago, they changed all the army commanders because they acted weakly. A week, so it was a slap. Uh, so that's why Khamenei had to slap the army in, in the face because of their conduct ten years ago. But uh, the, because local forces, always because they knew the people, they knew the people in their localities, and they also had fear because they were known. So they they uh, weren't uh, as trigger happy. So. It was mainly the Basij, even the IRGC, because some of them were had families, they were older, they were sons and daughters. Look, in the system, in the body of uh, the IRGC and army, some 90% think the same way as the ordinary people do. They don't, they don't believe in the supreme leader. They don't believe in the intelligence service. They don't believe in even those who've come to Syria and returned from Syria have changed their minds about the system. When the order was communicated, those who were more trigger happy, the unit that were more trigger happy, and I can say there were they, it was the Basij. The Basij militia were the trigger happy unit. They did not care. They were killing people indiscriminately. They didn't care who they were shooting at, who they were killing. And they were excited. They, and it was, it was, they are, uh, they were very, it was, in, it was a kind of a frenzy. They were not experienced like us. And, um, Sorry, they're, they're, they seem to have lost volume. Uh, oh, sorry. Or in Luristan, they sent special units. Sorry for the vo voiceover. They have problem with the sound. They're just fixing that. The voiceover person says he, she cannot hear. Not 
private session. I, I didn't hear. Sorry. Sorry, could you repeat that, Mr. Sabri? Just I wanted to remind the witness that we are still in the pri open session. The reporters are here, not in the private session. Just for the witness to know. Mm -hmm. Can can the witness hear the translator? And can the translator hear the witness? I'm sorry, I'm still waiting. That's the interpreter talk. Mr. Mr. Witness, what what are you waiting for? No, it's a technical issue on the end of our team here, Mr. Chair. It was the Basij unit that uh, were firing more um, bullets, but in some special, specific places, such as Mahshar, Khuzestan, Shishadanya, Karaj, Mashhad, they were special um, units that were sent, and in um, when it and they have the same power as the 5,000 of the IRGC, as which I previously mentioned. They have very powerful, They once they enter the scene, they ask all the other forces to leave, and whatever they say has to be obeyed by all the other forces. They cannot say no to these special forces. Can you describe those special units a little more precisely, is there a name for them? Is, do they come from a, um, various of the security forces? Are they their own force? What precisely is a special, um, a special unit? Uh, These units have, ha, are units that have been trained. They are very... Um, um, tall, well-built, strong-built, very strong constitution. They have a very um, uh, black belt in karates. They have a 2020 vision. They are, uh, and uh, even they are constantly being trained as well as receiving a written training. Even their they have they are sent to camps in syria lebanon and uh, even war stricken places these are this is a unit that's been trained for a situation when all other forces are helpless and can no longer deal with a situation they are the ultimate force the last resort um, especially in cities. I come from a city. Uh, but even in border areas, they send the uh, special IRGC force. This IRGC force, they've been trained to use coercive force. They, they're not responsible to any anyone. For, in, for instance, a police is held accountable if they shoot at anyone. But they are they have a license to kill anyone they want. And nobody, no one asks them, why did you kill? And who did you kill? You are the uh, kind of final trump card used by the system. Saberin, Saberin unit, Imam Ali unit, these two I can name. They are two of these uh, forces that are used as the kind of final trump card by the system to quell any unrest. Uh, you're, you're reminding me of, of a question to go to your description of the um, detention units that were maintained or are maintained by the IRGC and the misbehavior, let's put it that way, beatings and other 
things that occur in these units that are perpetrated by members of the IRGC. And is it your experience, is it within your, your knowledge uh, to say whether these forces engage in this behavior because they feel coerced to do so? Or are they assigned to a detention unit, for example, because they're voluntarily agreeing to participate in torture, beating, etc.? Um, are they, is there any reluctance on the part of these members to engage in this kind of behavior? You have a sense of that that you can give us. In, in response, I can, it's all relative. I can tell you there are some who really enjoy this torture. They, uh, they uh, in a sadistic way and they enjoy it and they actually believe and believe me, they would even torture their own family. And there are some who are within the intelligence ministry or the IRGC intelligence who are not happy with this situation, but they have no, no other option, like myself. I put, uh, I spend my life working for the system. I've given my life to it. And finally, I realized I'd made a mistake. Like many people in my country, if you put, if you uh, have a referendum in my country now, monitored by international organizations, and I, of course they have to put pressure on China and Russia to allow such a referendum to take place. Believe me, only maybe one percent would uh, vote for the system. And I tell you, the m main body of the military and intelligence also thinks the same as the people. But this is this is un. Uh, but as I said, it's relative. Your question, I can't say everyone in general, they, they all feel the same. But I can tell you the majority are not happy doing what they have to do. I'm wrong, though, that if an individual working in one of these units refused, for example, to beat a prisoner, just as one example, would that individual then be disciplined for that? Would they be punished? Would they simply be assigned to another area? What would happen? Um, the, I can tell you what he was told to do to that prisoner. He will suffer twice as much as that prisoner, as what he was supposed to do to that prisoner. For instance, if an accused, if somebody has been accused of um, being a dual citizen or having been a political activist, if you refuse to torture that prisoner or deal with it, then you will be considered a Muharreb. Uh, acting enemy of God. Um, I am just going to charge my phone. Uh, the witness says, please bear with me.
Are we ready to proceed or? I guess we are. Um, just to follow up on the last portion of your your testimony, um, I gather from what you just described that uh, there wasn't any, even among the the troops that, as you say, didn't believe in this system, and I, you estimated that maybe ninety percent didn't necessarily believe in this system. Uh, but there, but there was no resistance. Am I correct in that? In, in uh, that, individuals felt they could not resist this, or they did not resist it, or perhaps I'm wrong, and some did resist it. It's your experience. Carmen, and you are completely correct. There was a network of intelligence of the IRGC. There is a network of the IRGC um, intelligence service, so nobody dares to oppose the diplomatic behavior of the system or the policy of the system against the detainees, against the opposers, against the protesters, artists the policies of the state against the laborers, businessmen and the like. Nobody dares to oppose the policies of the state, of the system. If they would oppose, then they would have to go and respond to the intelligence department of the IRGC. If you are summoned to the intelligence department of the IRGC, you will lose all what you had done in the past. You will uh, not have the chance uh, you will lose that your oral relatives would lose the chance of getting employed in the official positions after so you will be deprived of all the um, privileges after that's why people are frightened they don't believe in their own powers that they can resist they can oppose and they have power and they can say what they believe in and that's even among security forces Yes. As I already mentioned, the security forces, there are some people among the security forces that I know in the Ministry of Intelligence, among the Intelligence Department of the IRGC. In the private sessions that we have, I have heard from them that they have been unhappy with what is going on. They have, over, they have also said, quoted what was going on, reported what was going on. They are unhappy themselves, but they did never felt the power to resist or to speak out. There is no one who would be able to present a general policy like Khomeini in 1357, at the time of the revolution, 1979, that would organize the opinion of the people, attract the views of the people, and to present it like that. Unfortunately, the people only complain in private meetings because the economic situation is very difficult too. People don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to be reported to the intelligence department of the IRGC. And this is a very big impediment for anything uh, basic and fundamental to happen in Iran. I have just one last question. And it relates to your comment about the besiege, besiege, besiege. Um, we've gotten a fair amount of information that the members of this group countrywide are primarily people who are under the age of 18, mostly kids, that um, their training is questionable, that many have been in trouble criminally with the law and then are recruited into this group that many are offered, um, I don't want to say bribes, but positive 
uh, potentials in their life that otherwise they would not have access to as a means to bring them into this group. And I'm wondering if that's a fair description of it. M M yet Allow me to give a, an explanation about the besiege. Up to two years ago, when the system still had dollars, a lot of money, and did not have much economic problems, or the economic problems had not come to the fore very much, the besiegers used to receive salaries. So the active besiegers used to get salaries. So besiege is an organization that can have uh, can include anyone, even the criminals. They say that we are so attractive that even the criminals have joined us. So Besiege is a an organization that does not recruit people. You don't go through a filter. You don't need to go through a certain procedure. You can just say that I am ready to go and stand there as a guard. They are very young. They would be happy to go and have a hand over the weapons once a week and to go and stop the people's cars, and to search people. Some people have psychological problems. Some people prefer to hit, to beat uh, girls, to take uh, alcoholic drinks from someone, and be happy that they have sent the individual to the court. So besieged participants are very young. They were being uh, supported financially by the state up to two years ago. But in the past two years that the system is facing financial problems, and the system uh, has shown that uh, it uh, is uh, not quite fit financially. So the besiege uh, is not receiving much salary. It's about 200 to 300,000 two months of uh, money that they pay as salary, which is very low when uh, compared uh, to other salaries. So. Uh, there are some priorities given to besieges. For example, they can be employed much more easier than the other places. So if a, an office wants to employ someone, they will go and look for the besieges first. So it's, there is a sort, sort of a privilege for the besieges. So the besieges, uh, if they have any specialized forces, they will be immediately recruited. Um, but any kind of employment will start from the besiege. So there is a particular privilege for besiege. If you have been in the besiege, then you would know that you would be employed certainly in a few years' time. If you're in besiege, you can get letters for your banking works uh, to receive loans and the like. And we had the Mehr Bank, uh, which has now been um, uh, merged in other banks. Um, besiege can give you letters. If you are, you can get a letter and get employed in an office. Uh, if they. Um, want to recruit someone. So you can also get loans if you are in besiege. You can also uh, serve as a conscript uh, less. Um, and if you had been in the besiege, then about 20 days or 30 days, you will uh, work less in as a conscript. So there are a lot of privileges for those who are in besiege. And a final, final question, and I promise this time it really is the final question. Um, who controls the besiege? Who gives them orders? How are they kept under control? <laughs> How do they, for example, know, as you mentioned, uh, they could go out and engage in violence against protesters, shoot guns? Who, who gives orders to them? Who controls them? Uh, <laughs> Besiege works under the IRGC. I may say that my friends in the police force would also endorse what I'm saying, that the IRGC, that the, um, that the police force cannot do anything uh, when uh, confronting the besiege. So if the besiege comes and inspection posts, the police would not be able to tell them off or do anything. They can arrest and detain people. The besieger can detain people, but the police cannot say anything. So the police is, in fact, at the service of the besieger in some form or another. And the police that are not helping the besieged, they will be immediately removed. 
So the police has to cooperate with besiege all the time. Otherwise, the besiege, the police officers will be immediately replaced. So besiege receives order from the IRGC, and it is the resistance force of the IRGC. The IRGC has got the ground force, uh, air force, naval force, but they receive order from the resistance force of the IRGC. They are, in fact, a part of the IRGC, the unofficial members of the IRGC. Thank you very much. Ms. Katrin Sunkana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I just would like to uh, follow up uh, the uh, question from, from Judge uh, Rohan just now on chain of uh, command. Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned that uh, the command. Um, of shooting or uh, contain the riot uh, by the measure of violence came from uh, commander in chief. Yeah. Uh, who is the commander in chief in this uh, respect? Uh, is he the uh, supreme uh, leader or the leader of the army, the police, or? Uh, and how the command uh, come through to the local uh, level. Yeah. Uh, and uh, is there any protocol or standard operating uh, procedure uh, for, uh, uh, yeah, uh, or a structure to do so? Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, Actually, you already explained, but uh, Albert, I want to uh, ensure the uh, chain of uh, comment. Thank you, Mr. Reynas. Yes, I already explained several times, maybe a bit uh, in a scattered manner. This is a specialized question. You know that uh, the order to shoot comes from the top. So the forces in the field will receive order from the their commander of the force. For example, when the ground force uh, got involved in Karaj, uh, they should have received the order from uh, the uh, commander he command headquarters. And the command headquarters receives this order from the supreme leader, the commander in chief. So for a for shooting once or twice or ten times, the force may decide by itself shoot at people from waist down. They may say that I was in danger, so I uh, had to shoot and write a report on that. But in connection to shooting all the people in all cities, in, just for the incre pr protest against the increase in the prices of oil, that would need a major order, and that should come from the commander-in-chief. And the commander-in-chief, you know who he is. I don't uh, deem it necessary to repeat the name. That uh, order has to come from the top. And when that uh, order has been issued, according to the reliable sources that I have, then uh, a uh, command uh, center, which is in the office of the supreme leader, uh, uh, I don't, as I said, this is a specialized discussion. I don't want to open it here uh, through certain um, networks of uh, um, uh, secure lines. The order is being issued and goes down. Nothing needs to be written, uh, be in writing. Everything is verbally done, and it is being done through secure lines. The order is being issued through secure lines, and it goes down. So, uh, in general, is there any uh, written protocol or standard operating procedure uh, to do so? Just a general, general. Baby need uh, yeah. A message goes to the uh, commander in chief, and some of the heads of state have also confessed in 
the state TV that Tehran is being lost. If Tehran is lost, the country is lost. And on the second night, the third night, Tehran it was being lost. People were becoming heartened to go on to the streets with their children. In 1388, the children didn't go out to the streets with their children, but in 1908, they went out with their children. Nobody was banning their children to go out because it was an economic issue. It was the issue of hunger. People are being are starving. And there were some people who had come, turned out in the streets because of bread. It wasn't like 1388. That was a political issue. The order comes from the top. The order is being issued, and then the shooting takes place. When the shooting takes place, that shooting, when the security of the country, the national security is discussed and the collapse of Tehran is under discussion, there is no need for protocol, there is no need for law, there is no need for the order of the prosecutor, there is no need for telex or fax or anything. That is to say from a certain uh, uh, lines like uh, the IRGC COSAR line, which is internal. Somebody picks up the phone and very easily tells uh, the other side that you send your forces and fire at will. Go to that place and have that place closed down. So in view of the fact that everywhere is being monitored and the information are being fed uh, back and it is being uh, clearly explained where there are clashes, where there are dangers, and there was order of fire at will from the top. Therefore, the forces went to the places where there were greater clashes. I believe that I should not explain any further in this session about the uh, process. Yeah, um, you mentioned that um, if uh, uh, People on uh, Batis or police or the army refused to uh, implement, implement the order. Uh, they will be replaced uh, to other city or maybe uh, fired. In your experience uh, uh, or your knowledge, according to your knowledge, um, uh, if uh, someone refused the order, uh, could be uh, tried uh, and uh, convicted as the Moharib? Because the, the comment has come from Supreme Leader, right? You have to bear in mind that in any anywhere else around the world in a military uh, in the military if you disobey a command yes you will be court martialed it depends on um, the scale of uh, your uh, of the issue but in Iran it's different it's like the Taliban it's ideological that if you refuse to obey the order of the commander in chief, that means you are the enemy of the Lord of the Age, you are the enemy of the martyr, you are the enemy of God, and they can easily execute you. And any such refusals, they would not even take, send them to prison. They would take them to the intelligence ministry, especially detention center. They would subject him to all kinds of torture. And he would leave as somebody who is uh, totally um, um, destroyed, a destroyed person who will n not be able to do anything, to attend any gathering. He will not be able to write anything, to say anything, to speak to and uh, to have any involvement especially in the social media. I know a few who are uh, in that dire situation at present. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Your testimony is uh, really, really uh, important. Ms. Saudi? 
Um, my questions for now have actually been asked by um, by others, so I'll hold on for the private session for the remaining uh, Sadae, ones. Thank you. Sadae, uh, Shoma Haspel. Ms. Firstman. Thank you, Mr. Witness. I just have a few questions on the basis of the general role and your general understanding during the events. Um, the first question is that we've heard from a number of different witnesses that banks were burned and government property um, was, was burned. Uh, is this something that you might be familiar with? I personally did not see any government building to go on fire except maybe a few bus siege units from within in, uh, and people had uh, and because they had shot uh, the bus sieges from inside their unit people had shot back and maybe there was fire there <clears throat> but government and uh, government buildings were being protected by Saperi and also a Naja special forces and the snipers were on the roof of such government buildings and nobody would dare approach these buildings. So I cannot, I cannot uh, say that that is true. And also I feel I'm beginning to feel a bit frightened now because I've been talking to you for longer than I thought I would. And I just thought I wanted to mention that, especially because um, you haven't even started the closed session. So please respect my time. And I cannot talk to you for too long because I am scared of um, my position right now. But in case of the petrol stations, we had reports that some of the local elements, in order to allow the besieges to shoot and to force people back home, uh, because if you have ordinary protesters, you cannot shoot at them just for protesting and for chanting slogans. So there should be an excuse. So I was informed that there were several cases, maybe two or three cases, where in the greater Tehran area, some of the inside uh, um, um, forces had burnt petrol stations to blame people. But in many cases, the people themselves had burnt the uh, gas stations because they had uh, got involved in clashes and as a result, the people themselves had burnt the gas stations. Thank you. And um, we've also heard a report uh, by uh, someone who testified before the panel that some violent prisoners uh, were taken out of prison in order to join the forces. Is that something that you are aware of? Bad. Yes, I am. Yes, I have. Since everything was developing very quickly and no planning was made to control the riot, um, uh, of course, we have some. Uh, the, 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 there is uh, some repentance papers that are being given to criminals. So after they sign a repentance uh, paper, then the criminals are allowed uh, to get involved in a process. My time was for one and a half hours. If you would allow me, I will stop now. I, I cannot carry on any longer. I am in a situation that uh, security-wise, I am unable to carry on any further. If the, uh, if the chairman would allow me, I will stop. My time was just uh, for one and a half hours. Now I am receiving uh, some duties. I have to 
get in, get, I have to do my duties and I have to go back. If you need any further information, I can provide the information to, uh, to you later through your colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Witness, for attending. If, if it's at all possible and you're able to come back, we would appreciate it. But if not, uh, we thank you for your testimony um, and appreciate the courage that you've shown coming forward. I also would like to wish you success and the uh, prosecutor council, uh, the judges, the Iranian people, and I wish you success, especially Mr. Chairman, and I say goodbye to all of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Witness.